here. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Josh McGinney. I work out of Corpus Christi at the center here. Um, cover most of South Texas as an extension agronomist. So I work in row crops uh, as well as uh, improved forages. So uh, your improved pastures, hay production, that sort of thing. So topic today is ways that we can enhance the crop production side of things by reducing the competition from weeds by effectively managing our weeds. And so as we move into this, I, I kind of want to start at Weed Ecology 101 um, and, and look at common characteristics of problematic weed species. And, uh, you know, the first course I took at Texas A&M as a grad student was, of course, just like this, just outlining weed ecology, the basics, because you have to understand how the weeds grow, how they reproduce their life cycles so that you can understand how to uh, efficiently control them. So I want to start with a few examples here. Uh, this first one being a, a species called Palmer amaranth. Uh, we have a few other closely related species in the state. Um, these are really uh, causing us a lot of headaches in row crop production, and they can cause issues in pastures as well, primarily because of their reproductive capacity. So a single one of those plants that you see in that, that upper left photo can give you hundreds of thousands of seed. Uh, in some cases, over 2 million seed per plant. And that really dictates our control strategies for any any plant like that. Okay, we can't allow them to make it to seed production. We have to take care of that issue before they reproduce uh, because these plants are so competitive and they can get up so quickly in the spring and produce so many seed and generate these massive soil seed banks that become issues for years and years and years. So understanding the biology of that plant tells us how to control it, tells us the, the, the effective ways there. And a lot of other weed species, common weed species, have that same characteristic. They produce a lot of seed. And by and large, this is true for annual species, not only broadleaves, but grasses as well. So you can see here crabgrass, Texas panicum, uh, even the uh, annual bluegrass, which is uh, poa annua that grows in your yard during the winter, even those little poa annua can give you thousands of seed per plant. So again, that understanding of the biology and ecology of these plants tells us how to control them. Another annual that causes a tremendous amount of headaches is this one here. This is a grass burr or sand burr. Um, that plant has a, a couple of different traits that allow it to be so uh, detrimental. Number one is that capsule. Um, what you're looking at when you look at the burr on a sand burr is not the seed, it's actually the capsule that surrounds the seed. And that capsule has the spines, and those spines get into the, the soles of your shoes, they get into the fur on your livestock, uh, they get into the tires, like in this photo in the bottom. That provides a massive route of transportation for this species. Not only do they shed seed that drop um, immediately beneath that plant, but also those seed get picked up and they get carried long distances. So again, we can't allow a plant like that to go to seed because it spreads so easily. Uh, that photo there in the bottom, uh, that's actually the front tire of my pickup, where uh, you know I was wondering why I was getting such a sand bird problem in our yard up in Llano County. Well, it's because I was driving through fields like this, and then I was parking that pickup in the yard. Um, that also tells us that we need to do a better job of sanitation in that instance, cleaning equipment off, cleaning tires off before we go and park in these weed-free areas. Another characteristic of sand burr that causes it to be such a big problem is its ability to grow in tough environments. So when you, you think of the areas that you, you consistently battle that species, most of the time they're pretty sandy. So these are sites that don't hold water very well. Uh, they drain very quickly. Other species become scorched very quickly after we uh, stop receiving rainfall. But for a variety of reasons, sand burr can persist on those sites and, uh, and very quickly dominate those areas. So a couple of characteristics there really help that species become such a big issue. Another plant has a couple of unique strategies. This is a uh, common cockle burr. Uh, you're probably familiar with the burrs there shown in the upper left. Those burrs obviously have the little hooked uh, uh, protrusions off of that capsule that get into the, the fur of livestock and um, I know as a kid, one of my favorite things to do is throw these in my sister's 
hair and, and she would go for quite a while before she'd realize she had a bunch of or a bunch of cockleburs in her hair uh, but they they very easily cling um, to fur and, and, and hide a livestock and, and move off site so that's one reason that plant becomes an issue the other reason is that that capsule actually contains two seed there's a small seed and a large seed the small seed is highly germinable uh, more likely than not it will germinate the following year and the following season but that large seed has something of a dormancy mechanism built into it and what that means is that large seed will sit there in the soil seed bank for years five years ten years maybe more before it finally breaks dormancy and germinates so that plant has a backup plan it has a plan b so you have the highly germinable offspring that will come in probably the following season but then you also have those longer lasting uh, larger seed that can become an issue 10 years down the road so again that tells us we need to really watch seed production in a, in a species like this we can't afford to let them go to seed because they potentially pose a, a long-term issue for us especially once those larger seed get into the soil seed bank Here's another one. Uh, if you look uh, from a, more of a global scale, uh, this species has been ranked as the world's worst weed for a long time now. This is purple nut sedge. Um, the main issue arising here is that uh, this species has tremendous reproductive capacity below ground. So each of those plants can put out these uh, root like structures called a rhizome. Those rhizomes can produce tubers which can then produce additional rhizomes. So eventually you end up with these large networks of purple nut sedge, uh, these plants that are connected by a chain of rhizomes and tubers. Um, and that tells us how we have to go about controlling a species like this. It's not good enough to control the top of the plant only. We have to do something to manage what's below ground because there's such tremendous below ground reproductive capacity there. And then lastly, uh, Going back to uh, the example there of Palmer amaranth, uh, a lot of these annuals produce very small seed. Uh, Palmer amaranth seed runs about a millimeter in diameter on average, so very tiny. Um, and anytime you're dealing with seed that small, there's a lot of potential there for that seed to move off site in our equipment. So I'm, just as an example, showing you this mower deck in the uh, bottom right, you can see all that plant material sitting on top of the deck. If that's gone through a weedy patch, something with pigweeds in it, or another small seeded uh, species, there's a good chance there's seed there. And we're going to spread that as we move that equipment to additional areas. So, you know, this isn't exactly a plant adaptation causing this, but through our activities, we are responsible for spreading a lot of seed, especially these small seeded uh, weeds. So, this kind of goes into that box of preventative measures, things we can do to prevent seed from spreading by. Uh, thoroughly cleaning our equipment, things like that. So why do we worry so much about weeds? Why do we spend so much time and effort uh, trying to keep weeds out of our fields? Uh, and that really boils down to what we're looking at in this slide. This is a, a study we did uh, in the Brazos Valley a few years back, looking at a uh, coastal Bermuda grass field. Um, in that particular case, we went in and we used uh, a number of different herbicide treatments to treat broadleaf weeds that were growing there. We also left some non-treated areas, of course, to compare to, and then came back at two cuttings during that season to compare the forage production uh, in those treated versus non-treated areas. At that same time, we also separated all of the broadleaf weed material out of that, uh, out of those cuttings, so we can measure that as well. So we can quantify exactly how many, how much weeds were present there, and what the impact was. Uh, on forage production. So if you're looking at this chart here, let me get my arrow, um, the green bars show you the uh, areas where we treated the broadleaf weeds, the yellow bars are where we, we have non-treated checks, so we left the weeds alone, we didn't spray at all. The uh, columns there on the left hand side, that was the first cutting, kind of in late spring, and then we had a middle of summer cutting at the second cutting. And what you can see here you know, in that first cutting, you're looking at a difference of uh, over 700 pounds per acre between a treated area versus a non-treated area. So we're losing 700 pounds to forage production because of weed competition. 
even in that second cutting later on in the year, you're looking at nearly 500 pounds difference. So a tremendous amount of forage production is lost in this case due to uh, forage, uh, or excuse me, weed competition. And like I mentioned, we also measured, quantified the amount of weeds that were growing there. So as it turns out, in the treated areas, we ended up with about uh, five pounds per acre of broadleaf weeds, mostly silverleaf nightshade uh, in this experiment. Versus where we did not treat, we had roughly 100 pounds. And really 100 pounds per acre of, of, of any weed is not all that much. So this isn't a severely infested site, but nonetheless, 100 pounds of weeds cost us over 700 pounds of forage production. So in a, in a good year with plenty of water, we have plenty of fertilizer out there. You can equate this to one pound of weeds removed could give you seven pounds of forage grass back. So it does pay uh, to manage these weeds because they are so competitive uh, in terms of uh, their ability to, to steal water and nutrients away from the forage. So when it comes to managing a weed issue, and this is true across all disciplines, all crops, it really boils down to, to, to two main things. We have to identify the weed first, and then once we understand what that weed uh, poses to us in terms of uh, its competitiveness and in terms of maybe uh, livestock toxicity issues, then we can develop a plan for managing that, that problem. And it's not just about taking a herbicide to the field and spraying. Uh, there's a lot of things we do on the, the, the front side uh, in terms of preventative measures, cultural measures um, that can prevent weeds from ever becoming an issue. Um, and then we can use things like mechanical and chemical treatments to uh, clean up weed issues that do arise. So when it comes to weed ID, one of the best things you can do is to find a good uh, regional book that contains high quality photos that you can use to compare to what you're seeing in the field. Um, I'm here in South Texas, so two of the ones that I, I lean on heavily are those that are shown uh, on the left-hand side and in the middle. Those are tailor fit for South Texas. Uh, if you're in another region of the state, look for something more regional towards you. Um, but uh, nonetheless, look for something that has high quality photos, not only of flowers, but also the leaves as well, so you can compare those characteristics. Uh, the guide over on the uh, right-hand side is uh, Brush and Weeds of Texas Range. Um, that's another good publication, more of a statewide uh, type guide. I also have on my shelves here in the office, I have a, quite a few books that are actually uh, uh, wildflower ID guides, which as you're probably aware, one man's wildflower is another man's weed. Uh, so those can be handy guides as well. But nonetheless, good high quality photos and uh, preferably a local uh, oriented book. And then, like I said earlier, once we know what the plant is, we can develop a management strategy. So we're going to talk about preventative, cultural, uh, mechanical, and chemical methods here. So when it comes to preventative methods, basically this is anything you can do to keep the weeds from ever showing up in the first place. And so going back to the example with uh, Palmer amaranth uh, hiding out on equipment, that's a, that's a big problem. Anytime you're borrowing equipment from a neighbor, or purchasing equipment from out of state, potentially you're bringing in new weed issues to your, your operation, weed issues you really don't want in the first place. So sanitation of equipment is a big, big aspect here. Um, and also, if you're putting in a new pasture, uh, whether it be seeded or a sprigged hybrid Bermuda grass, make sure you know that material's clean, you're not bringing in weed seed from those areas. Uh, it's always a good idea if you're buying sprigs get to know the person that you're buying sprigs from um, so that you know you're not bringing in a, a bigger problem putting in that new pasture. Cultural methods uh, have a tremendous amount of value if we're talking about improved forages um, because in many cases we're dealing with a crop that is highly competitive and a prime example there would be uh, one of the hybrid Bermuda grasses that are pretty common down here in South Texas given the water and the nutrients those crops are very very competitive they produce a dense thick stand of grass if managed properly and that's an environment that is not all that conducive to weed uh, establishment and growth so across the board the cultural methods or anything you can do 
to make that area unsuitable or unfavorable for weed growth. A lot of the annual weeds thrive on soil disturbance. They thrive on bare ground, bare soil. Uh, that's where they like to come in and establish. So anything we can do to prevent opening up of bare soil patches, things like that, again, so we have a dense, thick stand of grass. So this is kind of where I like to start and end a lot of times if we're talking forage weed management. Yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about herbicides and rates and, and whatnot, but at the end of the day, the best thing for managing weeds is that crop. It's the, the forage stand. And so just to kind of compare and contrast, uh, yeah, these two photos are hybrid Bermuda fields uh, in Brazos County that I took on the same day. Uh, the one on the uh, left-hand side, the management was quite poor. They weren't fertilizing. They were grazing continuously. They were not taking care of weed issues in a timely manner. Um, and it didn't take very long, about two years in this case, to really damage that pasture. And you can see what that causes. You see all the, the bare ground there. That's a tremendous amount of opportunity for an annual weed to come in and establish. You compare that to the photo on the right-hand side. That's a hybrid Bermuda. It's a coastal in this case. Um, managed appropriately. In that particular instance, we soil test every year. We fertilize appropriately. Um, and given enough water, and this was taken in 2013, and we, we did have plenty of water, um, you can see how thick and dense that stand is. It's going to be a very tough for a, a weed, especially an annual uh, broadleaf weed, to come up in the middle of that thick, uh, vigorous stand of grass. So again, a strong stand of forage in a lot of ways takes care of itself and prevents a lot of weed issues from ever becoming an issue. But we do have to deal with uh, quite a few problems, uh, especially in droughty years, even though we're doing everything we can uh, to grow the thickest, densest, healthiest stand of grass, uh, we can't always uh, uh, prevent all weed issues from, from arising. Again, especially in droughty years, uh, it's kind of out of our hands. So we have to rely on treatments, things to take care of or remediate weeds that come through. Um, and, and this starts with mechanical methods in a lot of cases. Uh, where we don't have good selective chemical options, we have to go in and spot treat or in a lot of cases hand pull or use a sharp piece of metal on the end of a stick like a hoe. Um, guy I worked with at the Brazos Bottom Farm coined this term hobicide. At the time we were managing a lot of conventional crops where we couldn't spray uh, things like Roundup over the top. So you become very familiar with uh, mechanical methods in that case. And you know in a pasture situation that's a perfectly viable way to manage weeds. It's a lot of labor um, so it's definitely scale dependent. You're not going to manage thousands of acres this way. Um, you're not going to manage very thick, um, heavy infestations of weeds this way. But if you do notice a patch here and there of something new starting to encroach into a pasture, um, it is worth your time to get out there and take care of that issue immediately. Hand pull it, hand chop it. From the chemical side of things, we can spot treat uh, with a, a non-selective type herbicide. But mechanical methods have a lot of use here. Mowing uh, can be useful, you know, as a broadcast mechanical method. Um, you know, basically with mowing, you're, you're looking at preventing seed production of some annuals. Annuals that get up there above uh, the crop very quickly. When they're flowering, we can go in there and we can mow and prevent some of those plants from going to seed. They don't, uh, you know, this method doesn't have a lot of uh, long-term use. Uh, over time, some weed species can adapt to that. Uh, frequent mowing and they'll start to flower lower and lower on the plant to escape that mower. Um, but mowing can be a, a perfectly viable tool for managing weeds in some cases, especially if you're up next to an area where you don't want to spray. If you're up next to a sensitive area like a tomato garden or a school or something like that, uh, mowing might be your only option. Um, and in those cases, that's fine. And, in other cases, I, I think chemical methods are, are probably our best bet. And we're lucky in the range and pasture field because, especially when it comes to managing a broadleaf weed issue, because we're managing a broadleaf and a grass crop, we have a lot of options out there for selective chemical control, meaning herbicides that affect the weed but not the crop. By and large, 
Uh, most of these are what we call synthetic auxins. Uh, you might hear these called uh, growth regulating herbicides. This is a class of chemistry uh, made up of, of several different compounds, but uh, across the board, they all act in a similar manner. Basically, they mimic a naturally occurring growth hormone within the plant. And so we basically overdose that plant with that growth hormone, and they uh, start to exhibit symptoms like twisted stems and petioles. Uh, the leaves will curl up. Um, those materials cause a lot of other imbalances within the plant, and eventually we see plant death uh, in, in many cases. But again, this is a broadleaf class of chemistry. They're very safe on grasses. Like I said, there's a lot of different compounds in that class. Um, they all vary in their little niche roles, their strength on certain species. Uh, some have soil activity, others do not. But it's a, it's a widely used class of chemistry uh, and very valuable for us in pastures. Again, if we're managing a broadleaf weed. For grass weeds, though, um, the options are much more narrow. Uh, in some cases, we have some selective grass active herbicides. Um, we have one for uh, Bermuda grass specifically, but across the board, we're looking at very few uh, useful options there. So from a broadcast point of view, grass weeds are going to be tough. Uh, so in a lot of cases, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to rely on things like spot treatments. And that's a perfectly viable way to manage some weed issues. Uh, it's just a, a pump-up sprayer loaded with something like Roundup or glyphosate. Um, take care of these weed issues become, before they become more widespread. Um, but in a lot of cases, for significant grass weed issues, we're, we're really going to have to rely on cultural methods to help snuff out those problems and, and crowd them out. So today, for our purposes here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about a uh, specific herbicide to spray at this rate to kill this weed, those types of recommendations, because we have a lot of uh, good publications out there that outline that in greater detail than I can cover. Uh, and I'll give you links to all those resources at the end. I really want to focus on broad concepts, key concepts for chemical weed management. Um, I'll touch on a couple of specific uh, weed issues, but outside of that, again, we're going to keep it somewhat broad. And I have to start here with read the label. We can't say that enough. Um, and I, I don't know what the, the story is behind this photo. Uh, I just pulled it off of the web. Uh, but I have to imagine that the person that made that mistake would not have done so if they had read that label of whatever it is they put in the sprayer. Um, so we can't we can't reinforce that enough. There, there's so much information in these labels. Sometimes it's a little cumbersome to read all that material, um, but it, there is everything that you need to know about weeds that it controls, crop safety, how to mix it, uh, what personal protective equipment you need to be wearing, how you need to set up your spray rig. All of that material is on these product labels. Uh, and a lot of times we gloss over that fact and we just jump to immediately putting a uh, herbicide in the sprayer without reading that material. The next uh, big step is in sprayer calibration. So this is true for many things outside of herbicides, but uh, the dose really does make the poison. And if we're talking herbicide specifically, if the dose is too low or the rate is too low, we stand a good chance of missing the weeds. Meaning you know, those, those rates are there on the label for a reason. That is what it takes to kill that weed. If we go lower than that, even if it's intentional, maybe we're trying to cut costs, that's not a good plan. Uh, we're probably going to see some failures in weed control. On the flip side of that, though, rates which are too high can cause us some other issues. Uh, like I said earlier, the growth regulating herbicides are very safe on grasses. That is only if they're used at labeled rates. Uh, if the rate is too high, even a growth regulating type herbicide can hurt grasses. And that's especially true for some of the newer chemistries uh, and other families of herbicides. The rate is very important. If we go very much above that, we can really damage the, the, the desirable vegetation out there. So anytime we're broadcast applying, we need to make sure that equipment is calibrated and that's gonna depend on three things. Application speed, the output of the sprayer, and the concentration of the herbicide in that spray tank. 
and we can manipulate those three things to dial in that, that actual herbicide rate. We could talk for a long time on sprayer calibration and all the different ways to do that. That's not really my aim today, but I do want to direct you to some resources there. So if you go to the, the website shown in yellow at the bottom, that's bit.ly slash stxcrops, that'll take you to my page. Uh, on that page, there is a, a, a link on the bottom there to, uh, let me get my pointer out, to weeds and herbicides. If you'll click that, I have two publications up there that outline the whole process for calibrating a sprayer. Uh, one is for pump-up sprayers. The other is for a uh, more of a broadcast, large-scale type equipment. Uh, so please take a look at that. Um, I'll also put this link back up at the end of the uh, presentation as well. Okay, moving on, a few more key concepts here. Uh, we have pre-emerge or pre-emergence herbicides, and we have post-emergence herbicides. And you have to understand how those materials work, uh, because they are very, very different. If we're talking a pre-emerge, and we do have some pre-emerge materials that can be used in pastures, that is a material that we're going to spray before the weeds come up. So once the weeds are out of the ground, you don't go for a pre-emerge. They won't have any real effect or activity on that weed. We have to get the material down ahead of those weeds germinating. Pre-emerges do not prevent weed seed from germinating. That's another kind of common misconception out there. What they actually do is prevent emergence only. So the weed seed germinates just fine, but then it uptakes that herbicide. And the herbicide will either inhibit root growth or shoot growth and cause that plant to die before it ever comes out of the soil. That last bullet point is really important. Uh, any pre-emerge across the board requires activation or incorporation. And what I mean is we have to get the herbicide into the soil. It's not good enough for it to be simply sitting on top. And that's what we're looking at in this, uh, this little diagram here. So, you know, typically most of our weed seed comes from that upper inch, inch and a half of the soil. That's where all of our major weed problems are germinating and emerging from. If we spray a pre-emerge and it just sits on top of the soil, that's not good enough. The weed seeds below will germinate. They will emerge right through that very thin layer of, of herbicide up top. What we have to do is incorporate or activate, and we do that primarily through rainfall. So we want to spray the herbicide, and then we want to catch some moisture. Uh, a half inch, three quarters of an inch of rain uh, or irrigation and what that does is actually move the herbicide down into the soil and it creates a treated zone. And that's what you're looking at in this diagram uh, between those, those dashed lines. That's our treated zone in the soil. So any weed seeds that germinate in that treated zone are going to uptake the herbicide and will have the, the desired effect. They won't come out of the ground. That's really helpful for us, especially in a perennial grass pasture, because it's very safe on the desirable vegetation. So the in this case, uh, we're looking at grass here that's already established. It has an established root system down deep in the soil. A pre-emerge is not going to hurt that established plant because it has all of this root structure down below to uptake water and nutrients. It's not going to take up much of that herbicide at all. So a pre-emerge is only going to be effective on newly germinating weed seedlings before they come out of the ground. Established plants, it will be very safe on. On the other side of that is uh, post-emerge herbicides. So in this case, this is what we typically uh, go to in a pasture situation. We have weeds that are up out of the ground. We can see them, and we want to do something to remediate that. We want to treat those emerged weeds. A uh, few key points here. Anytime weeds are stressed, they're tougher to kill. Um, it's kind of funny to think about it this way, but it is true that that kind of sub bullet point on the left hand side, healthy weeds are easier to kill. We want the weeds to be happy and healthy when we spray a herbicide on them. If they're slow growing, um, let's say a big cold front comes through tomorrow and it drops our temperatures down 30 degrees, okay, those plants are not going to be very active under those conditions. So that would not be a good time to go out and spray those weeds. Uh, on the flip side of that, if it's in the middle of July or August and 
it's been 100 degrees for a week and the, the humidity is down very low, the soil moisture is very low, plants are water stressed, that is not a time to go out and treat weeds. Those plants are very slow physiologically. Again, they need to be healthy so that we can effectively control them. Um, moving over to the right hand side, also during extreme conditions, uh, we can cause some crop injury issues. Uh, that's what's known there as phytotoxicity. Especially true in turf grass. Um, many herbicides that are safe on the grass normally can be quite injurious under extreme conditions, extreme heat. <clears throat> we can see the same things uh, in some of our improved pastures where if it's 95 degrees and those, those plants are stressed a little bit, we can actually hurt, um, hurt the crop itself uh, to a greater extent than we normally would. So across the board, under extreme conditions, that's not really the ideal time to go out and treat. Again, because we tend to have less of an effect on the weeds and we may cause some injury on our desirable plants. That last bullet point uh, is also important. Post-emerge herbicides, we're relying on them to get into the plant through the leaf. And so if it comes down a, a heavy rain right after we spray, we're probably going to wash all that herbicide off before it gets into the plant. Some herbicides penetrate the leaf quicker than others, so it's important again to read the label to see what that rain fast interval is, because if it looks like a rain tomorrow, um, you need to read that label and find out if it's okay to spray today. Or likewise, if a, a rain band is coming here in the next couple hours, you need to find out, is it okay if I spray now? Will there be enough time for that herbicide to get into the plant? And most labels will have some specific rain fast interval. Uh, if they don't, a good rule of thumb is four to six hours. Typically within six hours, uh, most herbicides will get into the plant in large enough quantities to, to, to do their job. Also, while we're talking post-emerge herbicides, uh, again, read the label and look for uh, a statement on whether or not you need to include a surfactant or a crop oil uh, because we're relying again on on all the uptake to happen really through the leaf and we're applying most of our herbicides in a water-based carrier many plants have on their leaf surface a cuticle that cuticle builds up waxes so if you have a, a rain on your freshly waxed car hood what happens the the water droplets beat up okay they don't really go anywhere the same happens with our herbicide sprays. So if we put a water-based uh, herbicide carrier on a waxy leaf cuticle, we're probably not going to get much of that herbicide into the leaf. If we add a surfactant or a crop oil uh, or other adjuvant, a lot of times those help us dissolve that cuticular wax. So we remove the wax, we get better coverage that way. Also, the surfactants help break the surface tension of those spray droplets. So it helps them spread out, so we get greater coverage that way too. All of those things allow us to get more of the herbicide into the plant, more of the herbicide into that leaf tissue. Some products do uh, already have surfactant packaged with them. Um, a lot of the Roundup products, name brand Roundup products have that. Uh, a lot of homeowner products for uh, lawn and garden use already have a surfactant. Um, Good rule of thumb is if, if you mix up a little trial batch of that herbicide and it foams, it, it creates a lot of foam and bubbles, chances are it has a surfactant in it already. But again, read the label to find out if you need to add anything additional. Okay, let's talk annual weeds now. Um, and this is going to rehash some of the things I talked about earlier. Uh, annual weeds like that Palmer amaranth they have a very simple strategy in life. Their whole goal is to get up very quickly. Uh, so if we're talking about a uh, summer annual, those plants are going to germinate and emerge early in the year. Uh, a lot of them are already doing so right now. They come up during that period of time because that's typically more favorable than the rest of the year for them. So we have good uh, rainfall during the spring, um, Typically, we're not looking at very extreme conditions yet, very high temperatures, anything like that. So they come up out of the ground quickly when conditions are good. They put on a lot of leaf, they flower, they set seed, and they die. And they're done at that point. So they're putting all of their energy, all of their uh, effort into 
basically seed production. They're not developing a large root system. So that dictates our management strategy. Like I said before, a lot of annuals produce a lot of seed. We don't want to let that happen, but we also know that we can control the top of the plant and get a full kill because they don't have a strong root system. So we want to get out early for annual weeds, prevent them from uh, producing seed. In a lot of cases, we can use uh, a pre-emerge herbicide to keep an annual from ever coming out of the ground. Uh, but once those weeds come out, then we want to manage them uh, in a timely manner before they set seed. Again, annual weeds, by and large, have a very limited root system. Uh, they're putting all that energy into above ground things. So if we can control the top of the plant, we can get full control on most annuals. So these are just a few of the more common annual weeds, uh, broadleaf weeds, marsh elder, uh, the crotons, broomweed, sneezeweed. Um, let me get my pointer here. I like this photo here of giant ragweed um, because the guy standing there with his hand in the air, uh, that's Dr. Tony Proven, uh, who manages our, our soils lab on campus. He's well over six foot tall. And so you can imagine how tall those giant ragweed are. They, they've got to be 10, 12 foot, something like that. That's not the time to go out and treat those, those annual broadleaves. The time to treat those plants was earlier in the year when they were small, two, three inches across, just a small little weak annual broadleaf. That's when we treat those plants. We can't let them get big because they're harder to control. We also don't want to let them get that far into the season because they're probably going to set seed. And that's our really our main goal, again, is to prevent seed production. So just as a blanket statement, annual broadleaves in a pasture setting uh, or a hay production uh, operation are not that big of a, a concern. We have a lot of products out there that very effectively and economically control a broadleaf plant and a grass crop. The key, again, is to get the job done early in the season. Uh, most years we'll have one big flush of annual broadleaves in the spring. If you can take care of that main flush, uh, you're doing a lot of good for the whole season. But do it before those plants flower, before they set seed. So when it comes to post-emerge broadleaf control, again, we have a lot of options. Uh, I have here just some approximate costs. You can see it's very easy to spend uh, 50 bucks, nearly 50 bucks per acre on some of these treatments. But for annual broadleaves, if you're treating early, a lot of times we can get by with cheaper products at lower rates. Uh, many times straight 2,4-D applied early can be all that we need uh, if we're dealing with, again, only an annual broadleaf issue. There is one annual, though, that causes a, a tremendous number of phone calls, not only to my office, but I'm sure county agent offices across the state and other specialists. And this is one species that I do want to talk about specifically. Uh, this is grass burr. We've touched on some of its strategies a little bit earlier. Um, most of the time when I notice that I have a grass burr problem, it's because I'm picking up those, those actual burrs and I'm finding them in my shoelaces, um, finding them in the, the fur on my dog, things like that. That's usually when we get a phone call about how do I kill grass burr in my yard or in my pasture or what have you that's really not the time to think about treating that plant. At that point, again, this is an annual, it's already set seed, the, the damage has been done. So the way that we manage grass burr is much earlier in the year. I want to start with a pre-emerge that's very effective on that species. That is Prowl H2O. Active ingredient there is pendimethalin. So if you also are dealing with uh, uh, grass burr in your yard, there's a lot of pendimethalin herbicides you can use in that setting. Prowl we can use for pre-emerge control of a lot of annual grasses. Uh, pendimethalin is known as a grass killing herbicide. Uh, some broadleaf weeds are affected by this, but mostly you're looking at annual grasses. That's the main appeal to that herbicide. Use rates have changed a little bit. You used to be able to go down below uh, two quarts to the acre that has changed now. It's just 2.1 to 4.2 quarts per acre and a maximum of 4.2 per uh, year 
Uh, the two quart rate in most cases is, is plenty, uh, except on very uh, heavy clay soils, things like that, you might want to go a little higher. There is now no pre-harvest or grazing interval restrictions on that label, so you can apply that material anytime. Uh, if we're going after sand burr, though, we're going to shoot for, uh, in most cases, you know, in South Texas, we're looking at uh, early February to mid-February. This year, though, we have completely missed the boat for catching sand burr with a pre-emerge because we've been so warm so early this year. Uh, sand burr has already emerged in South Texas. If you're elsewhere in the state, uh, I can't really speak to the timing there. Um, but a good rule of thumb is if you see the uh, neighboring farmers planting corn, you should already have your prowl or pendimethalin applied out there because they're planting that annual grass under good conditions for an annual grass to emerge, just like sand burr. So that's a good indicator of the timing. But again, this year, it's been so warm, the timing is all out of whack. Um, in most cases, I imagine sand burr has already emerged across most of the state. But again, key point here, that last bullet point, this is a pre-emerge. If you're going to use a pre-emerge, you need irrigation or rainfall uh, to activate that herbicide. Because again, if the herbicide isn't in that zone of the soil where the sand burr is germinating from, it won't really have any effect on it. So we've already established prowl, that's your pre-emerge option. Once sand burrs come out of the ground, if you're in a Bermuda grass setting, there is one herbicide that can be used there, and that's called Pastora. Uh, again, this is only for Bermuda grass. In any other setting, you run the risk of, of severely damaging your desirable plants with Pastora. But in Bermuda grass, we can treat sand burr uh, from a post-emerge uh, perspective, but only if those sand burrs are very small, an inch and a half in diameter or an inch and a half in height or smaller. Once they get larger than that, Pastora uh, is very hit or miss. Uh, in some cases, we can slow those plants down, prevent them from making some seed, but really, uh, as expensive as Pastora is, I wouldn't recommend treating unless you catch sand burr at the right time and the right size. Just as important as that, is that you also need to spray when the surrounding vegetation is low. Because you're going after such a small seedling, you don't want knee-high uh, vegetation surrounding it because we have to get spray coverage on that little bitty seedling. So, you know, two key points there. That's, that's uh, tricky to catch sometimes, but surrounding vegetation low, preferably under four inches, sandburr seedlings when they're very small, an inch and a half in diameter. Sometimes in South Texas, or especially if you're right along the, the Gulf, uh, this little annual uh, that we talk about being grass burr can't overwinter because we don't get cold enough or long enough to kill those plants. In those cases, you can add in a light rate of glyphosate that's outlined on the Pastora label, and that helps heat up that mixture, uh, perhaps control some of those overwintering sand burrs a little better. I see a question here on uh, what do you suggest about killing thistle? Mine keeps coming back even though I kill thoroughly. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of thistle species out there. Uh, I'll say that first off. Uh, across the board, though, we deal with a lot of biennial thistles that have a two-year life cycle. In that first year, the thistle forms a rosette, which is that flat, growing, uh, leafy-only plant structure. In the second year, those plants then bolt and flower and reproduce. Those thistles that have that life cycle, um, or, or any of those, even in, in an annual that forms the rosette and bolts in the same year, if you can treat in the rosette form, when those plants uh, are flat to the ground, again growing in that growth form, they haven't bolted or flowered, they're much easier to control. Um, you say here, mine keeps coming back even though I kill thoroughly, you might be dealing with uh, uh, quite a large seed bank, uh, a lot of thistle that's coming from seed. I'm not sure exactly, but uh, again, thistles that are in the rosette form are much easier to control. Uh, straight 2,4-D or a weed master type herbicide does a good job there. Once they're bolted and they've flowered, they're, they're much tougher to control. See here, uh, another question, what do you recommend for sand burrs in a native pasture? Uh, you can use prowl. Uh, it is labeled for perennial grasses. 
but in a native situation, you're dealing with more diversity, you might have some annuals in there that might be desirable, prowl will definitely damage them. Prowl is going to hurt annuals, uh, small seeded broadleaves, other annual grasses, uh, so you need to be careful in that situation. Uh, you cannot use Pastora in a native pasture. It is only for Bermuda grass. Okay, I'm going to move on. Sticking on the, the sand burr topic here for a little longer, uh, this is a site up in Robertson County we used for a, a number of years to look at uh, various sand burr treatments. Um, this is near Franklin, Texas. Very sandy soil. Um, nearly the only thing that grows on that side is sand burr. Um, and so what we've done in this uh, situation is we've sprayed one ounce of Pastora at the right time. And you can see that in the treated plot on the right hand side. Um, we caught those seedlings when they were small, again, less than an inch and a half in diameter, and Pastora works fairly well. It's not perfect, but it is the best option we have uh, from a post-emerge uh, standpoint. I want to stay on this topic a little bit longer because uh, if you're spraying Pastora for sand burr, we already mentioned you're going after a very, very small seedling. Coverage is critical. That's why we want the surrounding vegetation to be low. Also, you need to think about your application equipment. Um, I use boomless nozzles for a lot of things, but in this situation, a boomless nozzle is not the ideal application equipment. We want to use a standard boom type sprayer. I'll show you why here. This is this is what I mean by a standard boom type sprayer. We have a spray boom outfitted with multiple flat fan nozzles along that. Down below this uh, is a demonstration where we went out and applied uh, water with a blue dye uh, through our spray equipment over the top of uh, this paper so we could see our spray coverage. Over on the right hand side, that's the very outer edge of that spray swath. The middle is halfway out along the boom. Uh, and then on the uh, left hand side, that's the very middle of the swath. When you use a standard boom sprayer, you have even uniform spray coverage all along that width. And that's what we want if we're going after a very small weed like sandbur. If you use a boomless nozzle though, your, your spray coverage kind of suffers and that's just that's just how these nozzles work there's no way around that and so this is a uh, t-jet boom jet cluster nozzle um, these can actually be a very uh, handy boomless setup if they're set up properly but you can see the issues with regard to spray coverage underneath the spray rig in the middle of the swath you have good coverage halfway out uh, that coverage starts to suffer a bit but on the very edges of the swaths, on the edges of the reach of that, that uh, boomless nozzle, you can see the problem there where we have very few and very large droplets and there's a lot of empty space in between. So if we were going after a very small sandbur seedling, there's a good chance we might miss some of those plants. So again, boomless nozzles have a lot of uses, um, but I don't think uh, this would be the, the ideal use for them. So I'm going to wrap up on sand burr, control seedlings before they emerge with prowl. Once they're out of the ground, if they're very small and it's in Bermuda grass, we can control with Pastora. We can slow those plants down a little bit with Pastora, but I wouldn't recommend treating if they're larger. And then once they've formed a, uh, a complete seed head, there's really no point uh, in spending any more effort on them. We really need to catch them at the right time the next year. See a question here, uh, what about suppressing or killing Johnson grass? Uh, in Bermuda grass, Pastora works very well. Uh, another herbicide you might look at is uh, Outrider, uh, which is uh, sulfur sulfuron. Uh, very effective on Johnson grass, uh, also controls a lot of sedges, if that's an issue for you. Uh, the key there is if you're using Pastora, Johnson grass needs to be less than 12 inches tall, ideally 10 to 12. If you're using Outrider, you want to wait a little longer uh, until Johnson grass is about 18 inches tall and you can treat anything you know taller than that all the way up to heading. Um, Outrider kills very large Johnson grass. All right, moving on to perennials. 
Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking specifics, uh, but across the board, perennials are going to be tougher to control because they have those uh, extensive root systems they come back from. They have stolons, rhizomes, tubers, other re reproductive structures. They spend a lot of time and a lot of effort on that root system. They're not putting as much effort towards seed production. So across the board, perennials typically don't produce as much seed as an annual. So that tells us how we need to control a perennial. We're not as worried about seed production. We're really more concerned with getting a you know total plant kill, managing what's below ground as well as what's above. So with perennials, we're dealing with things like rhizomes, like tubers. If we're chemically treating, we need to be able to get herbicide into those structures below ground. control them. Silverleaf nightshade is a really good example of why that's so important. So if you look at that white line, horizontal line, think of that as the soil surface. And what would look like normally two separate plants uh, is actually one nightshade that has reproduced via that rhizome. If we were to go out there and disc up that pasture, you see those little dashed lines where we might cut up that root system. There's a good chance that on those pieces, those fragments of root, there might be buds, and those buds can produce additional plants. So it's not good enough to chop these up or chop them out in a lot of cases. What we have to do is get an effective chemical into the plant and down into the root system to get a full, uh, uh, full plant kill. So, like I said, perennials are going to be tougher to control. Some are easier but but many are tougher uh, in most cases perennials are going to require a more expensive product potentially higher rates in some cases we have to repeatedly treat what i would say here uh, you know, again i'm not going to go into a lot of specifics but stretch your money as much as you can by finding good proven effective uh, recommendations on products and i'll show you some resources there apply those products in a timely manner um, and that differs depending on the species. Some perennials we can treat early in the year, some we need to wait a little later. When it comes to brush control, timing is very important depending on the species. And then lastly, apply at the correct rate. And again, I'll show you some resources here to uh, uh, point you in the right direction. I just want to give you a couple of examples of why it's so important to find good information on what to spray at what time uh, for what species because not all perennials are created equal. So I'm going to show you kind of a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. Starting with western ragweed. Common weed found across the state. It's a perennial. But it's not all that difficult to control. Straight 2,4-D works fine on western ragweed. We can treat very early in the year, early in the spring, when those plants are small. And we can get good, effective, true control of western ragweed. That's not the case with silverleaf nightshade. Uh, nightshade is a much tougher plant. 
Yes, it's a broadleaf, it's a perennial, just like western ragweed, but it is much, much uh, more of a problem. Same story with Carolina horse nettle. Uh, those are very closely related species. For those types of plants, we need to go out with something a little more effective, a little more, in most cases, uh, expensive. Graze on next, graze on P plus D at fairly high rates. We typically spray a little later in the year when those plants reach bloom stage. And in a lot of cases, we have to repeatedly treat pastures to get full control of these, uh, these two species. So again, not all plants are created equal. If you're talking perennials, again, look for solid recommendations on what to spray before you just go out there and try things. Uh, make sure if you're going to spend the money and the effort, make sure you're doing so in an effective way. So I'm just going to point you towards some uh, resources here, and then I'm going to address some of the, the questions that are popping up here. Uh, for more information, again, because I didn't spend a lot of time on treat this weed with this herbicide at this rate, um, go to uh, this website at the, the upper bullet point. This is uh, Dr. Megan Clayton's website, southtexasrangelands.tamu.edu. From there, if you'll click the Publications tab and look for this document, ERM-1466, Chemical Weed and Brush Control. That is by far the best publication in the state. Uh, for managing uh, common pasture weeds and range weeds, along with brush, uh, brush control recommendations. Uh, everything in that guide has had multiple years of testing, uh, plenty of data to show you why uh, a certain treatment does or does not work. So that would be my first stop. Also, you might take a look at forages.tamu.edu. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Olson maintains that website. She's our forage specialist over at Overton. Uh, from that, you can click the weed control tab. She also has quite a few documents there, uh, recommendations that are uh, might be handy for you, especially for improved pastures and hay fields. And then lastly, uh, that's my website on the bottom, bit.ly slash stxcrops. If you click the forages tab, I have a lot of uh, a lot of resources there, weed, weed management guides, also those calibration guides that I mentioned earlier, they're also on that same website. So with that, I'm going to work through some of these questions. I see uh, from Karen, she says, my neighbor drug a large piece of carpet in her areas with sand burr to pick up as many of the birds as possible. She seemed to be very cognizant of spreading them to other areas. Do you think this is an option for smaller areas? No, uh, Karen, I, wouldn't, I would not recommend that. Um, I see that as a means for spreading sand burr to areas that you don't want it to be. Um, what you can do in, in very, thickly uh, infested areas with sand burr is go in and treat with something like Roundup uh, to control those plants. That's a non-selective herbicide. And then sometimes we might disc up that area. Uh, yes, to, sir, that's to, correct. To spur uh, an additional we'll flush of, and, of sand burr uh, so we can treat them uh, again. You know, uh, but I would not recommend dragging and it'd be, carpet it'd be through those areas. For I month think that's for just going to uh, uh, spread seed the list that uh, they want the slides. Uh, Kathy asks, uh, be best whorehound suggestions. I'm familiar with the species, Kathy, but I, I do not know off the top of my head what our recommendation is. Um, if you go to my website, my email is listed there. You might drop me a note and I will look for uh, the recommendation there. I'm also looking at uh, ERM 1466 right now. And uh, just kind of a, a just quick a note, second, is some of these uh, email systems now are getting really... Okay, so uh, out of the ERM 1466 the publication, the they do have Fortown. So uh, 2, 4 D sometimes mean by you itself have to be cut up or you one might to, get a PDF format. One to two like pints format. they show as being to, very uh, highly effective. To get there. The key is to uh, treat in that, the spring. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, McGinty, thank tall. you for everything. Again, uh, I'd like to say uh, that our moisture. next session, and, uh, and and we'll wait for more questions to come on. Y'all keep typing your questions. You'll have any questions. Uh, next session will be April the 6th. Uh, how much forage do I have? Let's see here, Karen asked, will you Dr. make your... Dr. Amy Kimura is going to be our speaker. Uh, are you referring to again, my uh, slideshow? You can follow us on Facebook under yes. Okay. Yes. This. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete. And you'll get this some uh, webinar will be posted up and, uh, for, webinar uh, announcements again, for others thank to look at later on I'm going to well. I'm try to post, uh, send you a link to this uh, survey. Please complete the survey. Um, Okay. And it'll really help us. And if you didn't get the link popped out, 
I'm also going to put it here on the bottom of the screen. Just click on it. Yeah, if you, if you want anything specific out of my slide set, uh, go, go to my website. You can find my, my email 